We are starting. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Christian Fellowship. Where we're saved by grace, walking with Christ, loving one another. That's, that is us. Hopefully everybody got a bulletin today. If you didn't, Connie will throw one at you. If she wads it up and throws it at you, oh no, she won't do that. That's what I would do. Yeah. Of course you would. <laughs> I love that. I love how my wife can say amen to that. Yeah, that's what you'll yeah. do. You'll have one to get your hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, Robbie. That's right. Uh, once again, uh, Wednesdays we have prayer, so keep the mind, go through that, and if you have any questions, let me know. I want to definitely highlight in the middle of our bulletins, we've got a QR code there that hopefully works and printed out well, but it's our Royal Family Kids Wish List. You're like, what is a Royal Family Kids Wish List? Well, uh, while they're there, then in a couple weeks, we're going to have the Royal Family Kids Camp. On um, one of the days of the kids' camp, since it's all foster kids or foster respite kids and stuff like that, uh, they actually celebrate their birthday while they're there. And because uh, some of these kids' birthdays are not very good events for them. And so they try to celebrate a birthday party and, and dress up for the kids. And one element is to have presents for the kids. And so if you want to check, that they have an Amazon wish list here. So if you have it in long form, you want to type all that out uh, and, you know, on your uh, browser stuff and get all the way to that. You can do that. If you have a cell phone camera with a QR code viewer, you can do that too. So two different ways of finding the uh, Royal Family Kids wish list there. They would definitely appreciate any kind of uh, gifts that you can bless those little kids with. Uh, last thing is the uh, men's barbecue and axe throw. We talked about this the other day. I you know, talked about my prowess of not being able to throw an axe. <laughs> but but it's gonna be, we're looking forward to fun. We're gonna be a barbecue and everything. So guys, make sure that uh, you have August 3rd penciled in on the calendar so that we can do that. If there are any other, if you have any other information or questions, talk to Roel about that. Is there any other things going on that we need to be aware of? Nope. All righty then. Let's get ready to pray and get ready to dive into God's word this morning. Father God, we just thank you now for this time to worship you in the word. Father, we just pray that you would just open it up to our hearts, minds, our souls, or that we would understand it, that we take it in. As always, Lord, I pray that... Uh, you would uh, give us soft hearts, Lord, that are ready to take it in, ready to keep it there. Let it soak in so that uh, our time here, Lord, goes with us when we go out the door, that we're thinking and contemplating your word and what you have to say. And we just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Reunion, Genesis 33, verse 1 through 17. I would have finished the chapter, except that the, the last couple verses of the chapter really kind of fold into the next one. So we'll do the last couple verses going into uh, chapter 34. As uh, you've been following along, of course, we the story of Jacob, and he's on his way back home. Uh, last week, he uh, discovered, you know, he had a, the week before, he discovered that the troops were coming. He had some panic prayer. Oh God, please help me. This is the worst thing ever. And then, of course, he made some preparations. He was still thinking pragmatically, like, how can I do this? How can I avoid disaster? And eventually, he was left by himself because that's who he was generally thinking about most often, was himself. And he had an, an awesome wrestling match with God. And you're like, wow, that was one-sided wrestling match, and yes, it was, but he resisted. He was wanting to have his own way. He was wanting a blessing. He was wanting what he already had. He already had a blessing. God had already said, I'm going to be with you. 
So he changed his name he gave the, from Jacob to Israel, one who's striving with God, struggling with God, fighting against God. As we've discussed, the, Israel, the name Israel has a lot of different shades to it, if you will. And so there it is. Now, we, as we come to this part of the story, as we see or find out that Esau's on his way, but I invite you to think about it as we go through the story today, to consider that in the Bible, there's a lot of repeats sometimes. In this story, there's shades of this story that Jesus actually used in the story of the prodigal son. In fact, Jesus did that quite often, where he would take different sayings and different stories and parables that they already knew, but he would turn them on their heads, change them up a little bit, shockingly so sometimes, so that they would be like, oh, he's about to tell the story of two brothers? Oh, we know who, which two brothers he's talking about. But then he twists the story and changes it up a little bit, and they're like, oh, whoa, just a second, that's not the story we remember, but man, that story, that story's good. That changes everything. And of course, these, this story, it has, uh, <laughs> both of those stories have, the kids have father problems. You know, that, so that would have been familiar to them. That's why the prodigal son is so impactful to that, to that culture, because they had this story. Both of the stories, one son leaves, the other one stays. Both of the stories, the, the sons behave badly in both the stories. So they, they understood this. And of course, most famously, they both have a, a momentous reunion. Just very emotional, very, and for the prodigal son, not only emotional when the son comes back, but then the older son's angry confrontation about everything that had happened is very, just tremendous in the whole story. Very poignant. And so it's against this backdrop that we have a reunion of Jacob and Esau that emotionally, people-wise, humanity-wise, would be and ought to be a story of revenge and justice against Jacob for what he did, stealing his brother's blessing. And instead, we're going to see a wonderful episode of brotherly acceptance. Esau is on his way. Esau is arriving. We don't have to wait very long for this worrisome confrontation to happen. It's right on the cusp. The cut, this confrontation has been brewing for 20 years. <laughs> Imagine 20 years of just chewing on a somebody that's stolen something from you and then beat feet out of town. And now you hear they're on their way back. You're like, for generally, most people are like, okay, <laughs> somebody's gonna get theirs. <laughs> that's how we would think. That's what we would chew on. And that's what Jacob's been thinking. Verse one, at the beginning of it, says Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, Esau was coming and his 400 men. Remember, that's what surprised him. He's like, oh no, he's not coming with just a couple of the kids, you know, the family, you know, stuff like that. No, he's bringing a 400 man army with him. And so again, as he'd done before, the last group that's there is the children and the family. That's all that's there now because everybody else had gone out ahead. Second part of verse 1, going to verse 2, it says, So he, and that be Jacob, divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants. And he put the servants with their children in front, and then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. So again, that kind of be listed them out. But for now, we're going to see a significant change. Post-wrestling match, there's Jacob has... Some paradigm shifts, some shifts in how he's thinking, how his life of faith is going. And so he decides to approach Esau from a more respectful position. So verse 3, it says, and he himself, rather than being the last guy, went on before them. 
bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. And of course, in, the, in scripture, often the seven points to something that is complete. So here he's showing, illustrating by bowing down, hitting the dirt seven times as he's on his walking towards Esau. Seven times he's showing complete submission, complete humility before him. He's like, I'm yours. And he's doing it in front of everybody, not behind. He's like, I'm, if I'm going to be the first to go, I'll be the first to go. It's my responsibility. I did this, not these guys. It's me. He's, he's discovering things now. He's, his whole outlook is changing. He's thinking about things honorably rather than being shifty and trying to find, you know, just little schemes to get things done. And so then Esau then does the beautiful and the unexpected. Verse 4, it says, but Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. That's such a, a beautiful story. And I'm sure Jacob's like, okay, didn't expect this. Did not expect this. And they're, they're, they wept. They're both crying. They're both emotional about it. This 20 year reunion is going in a very good direction so far. And of course, again, just as the prodigal son had that same event where the, the father ran to the son because he was coming home to an uncertain welcome. Jacob knew this. He didn't know what to expect. He had no idea. And Esau just shows that overwhelming emotional love for his brother. And of course, there's still this question because you know sometimes you can have a reunion where the first part of the reunion is like hey good to see you bro good to see your sister everything's good but you know there you got some baggage in this <laughs> reunion and he doesn't know it's just like okay this might be really good he might hug and kiss and we'll weep and then the knife will go in the back that could be it's all potential here still there is that is that could be what happened payback may still be in his mind so now we come to the question of acceptance and this been this is going to be an interesting part of this passage because it didn't go where i thought it was going to go mm -hmm. the acceptance as i was considering the aspect of it turned out to be different than what i was looking for so let's see what scripture has to tell us. Verse 5. When Esau lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, Who are these with you? And Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously, graciously given your servant. A lot of different things there. Here's Esau's opportunity to see the family. That's always good. And of course, Jacob emphasized the humble note. He throws in the phrase, he's like, your servant. He's like, you can see, he's, you're going to see much of it where Jacob's trying to communicate, just like, hey, you know, we don't have to go to the payback direction. I'm your servant here. I'm your humble younger brother. This is the way it should be. And Jacob introduces them in order of their importance to himself. Verse 6 or 7, it says, Then the servants drew near, they and their children, and bowed down. Leah likewise, and her children drew near and bowed down. And at last, Joseph and Rachel drew near and they bowed down. So this, these folks are introduced according to the affection that Joseph has for them. You know, lining them out, least important in his mind or in effect, to the most important. And notice the only son that is listed and spoke of is Joseph. That is already alluding to what we're going to find out further down the scripture of his favoritism towards Joseph. It's already there. Joseph has a special place in his heart because remember, he's the son of Rachel and Rachel was his true love in all of this. Rachel's his true love. So introduces him in that direction. Esau then asked, remember he, uh, 
Jacob had sent ahead five different herds of animals ahead. Tell them, they'd give them instructions, say, hey, these are yours. These are for Esau. You know, be nice. Play nice, Esau. Here's a lot of herds of animals for you, a lot of gifts. And so Esau, of course, asks about this in verse 8. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? Jacob answered, to find favor in the sight of my Lord. He's straight up. He's like, not going to smooth any more than that. He's like, hey, I need to find favor. He's like, he's finding it. He's seeing if it even exists. <laughs> Is there any hope in this confrontation that I'm not going to be taken out back and thrown into the pit and piled with rocks on me? That's, 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 I'm trying to find out here. Trying to divine where things are at here and so it's like to find favor and of course the favor there is the our word that we get for unmerited favor and it's the the word for grace here he's like he's wanting some graciousness some kindness unmerited favor or regard he's like hey i'm seeking to find favor here and i don't deserve it he's communicating that to them he's like they like hey you're my bro and we need to get along you know that's that's what mom always said <laughs> you two need to just shake and make up. He's not bringing any of that to the table. He's like, hey, I don't deserve anything from you right now. I'm giving you these animals to show you that I, I want to be friends again, and not, but I don't deserve it. And, of course, this is the same word. We, we found this before when Noah found favor in Genesis 6, 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Again, you know, people think about Noah and, and stuff, but he, he, even Noah had to get undeserved favor to, from God. Even though he was a, a good guy, he's like, hey, this guy is a pretty good guy. He still needed God's unmerited, undeserved favor. Yet, Esau does not readily accept or receive the gifts offered to him by Jacob, as we see in verse 9. Says, but Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. This sounds like a nice statement in our English and our uh, colloquialisms that we would say. But there's a problem. This is a big shiver down the spine moment that we don't catch necessarily in our culture. But in that culture, this is saying something that things might not be as cool as he thinks that they are. And maybe Jacob's right. Doom is around the corner here. Because in that culture, uh, when a present was brought by an inferior to somebody that was superior, that was uh, to, if the superior person received, refused it, that was a sign of disaffection. So in other words, like nowadays, if an employee brought a, you know, a, a gift card to the boss, and say, hey boss, here's, a, here's your uh, you know, gift card to Applebee's. And the boss like, no, I don't want it. And that culture would be a sign that, yeah, I don't really like you. <laughs> I don't want your gift card. That, that's what that would be. And, and sometimes, if you really, if you were doing this for friendship and stuff and it was not received, you had everything to fear. That's what it meant. It's just like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble if he doesn't accept my gift. Now this has implications that we think about the gospel. Some people, uh, you know, wonder, it's just like, boy, why is God so particular about, uh, you know, us having to receive Jesus Christ? Why, is God, why does God get particular about that? And there's other things like where the son says, if you honor me, you honor the father. If you don't honor me, you don't honor the father. That kind of language. That telling us that the idea of if you reject Jesus Christ, you're rejecting God comes from this idea. Comes from that culture. That cultural understanding, they understood to reject one meant to reject the whole thing. That's why Jesus constantly was hammering that, that point home. It's just like, it's all you got to accept me. It's a whole package deal. 
can't just like, oh, I want this part of the present, but not that part. It's a full meal deal here. That's why the, the book of Hebrews, if you go to the book of Hebrews, it, the theme of that is through and through, where the Jewish, there were Jewish believers considering going back to Judaism rather than staying with Christianity. They were being dissuaded. They were like challenged because of persecution and such. And he, he reminds them over and over, he's like, no, this, you've got to stay with this. this is, you can't be rejecting him. This is the only way. This way, this whole event here explains Jacob becomes a little distressed. And so he begins to press, press forward with the gift and with persuasion here to Esau, making a case in verse 10. He says, Jacob said, no, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then accept my presence for my present from my hand. For I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God, and you have accepted me. So again, he appeals to finding favor again. He's like, hey, you know, if it's there, if, if I'm finding favor with you, this undeserved pardon, it, it, you know, if that's there, if it's possible, would you do that? If he had grace for Jacob, Jacob herbs, Esau to, to prove it. He's like, if, there, if you really love me, if you're really on this, if you're really going to forgive me, accept this gift. Accept or receive my present. That's what he's begging him for. Jacob, he's appealing to him. He, he tells him, like, hey, to see you is like seeing the face of God. In other words, he's, uh, I don't think he's just buttering him up because that's language of what he just went through in this wrestling match. Remember, he changed the name of the place to to call, being called face of God. So he's recalling that. So a little bit of emotion here. He's like, okay, you know, hey, this isn't, I'm not the Jacob that left 20 years ago. He's explaining him to like, I'm a different Jacob today. In a sense. Jacob reiterates that to receive this gift was to receive him. He's like, that you have accepted me. He says, uh, that he, in the King James, it actually says, to be pleased with me. He wants to know that Esau does not view Jacob as an enemy anymore, but he's ready to, to be treated favorably. So he's looking for proof, and this, the, to receive this gift is the proof. Again, much like the gospel. Again, there's so many people like, oh, I'm going to prove to God that I'm, gonna, that, I, that I'm ready for salvation by doing all sorts of things. See, there's my proof. God's like, that's not the proof I'm looking for. The proof I'm looking for is that you receive my gift. So he continues with his plea in verse 11. He says, please accept my blessing that is brought to you because God, God has dealt graciously with me. Because I have enough. And thus he urged him. And he took it. So he, he reminds him that, they, that God has dealt graciously with him. He's like, hey, I know what it is. I, I didn't deserve something from God. And God has done, been gracious to me. Very gracious to me. It says, great. He's, he's now really sharing his testimony in micro form. God has dealt graciously with me. Undeserved goodness. And this is the heart of anybody that's, that if you've known that, you, you know, that's, this is the thing I've always encountered. People who have experienced the grace of God in great magnitude, when their life, when they know that they're, they, they were the definition of sin and wickedness, and they're like, yeah, this was me. I was sin on a stick, and I did not deserve any kind of graciousness from God at all. Uh, you know, if you listed out the commandments, it would be guilty, 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 oh, very guilty, guilty, and more guilty. That would have been me. And, that's what we and so that is the thing. When somebody understands that, then they understand this gracious gift that God has given them, and they receive it. That changes everything. That changes the way they do it. That's why Jesus said that in the tail end of Matthew 10 to 8, and in the New King James Version, I have it here. It's where it says, freely you've received, freely give. 
That's the thing. It's just like if we find ourselves being ungracious towards somebody, if we're like, just like you just don't have any kind of graciousness to share with somebody at all in any kind of form, you need to put on the brakes. You need to put on the brakes and say, Lord, have I forgotten how much I needed grace? Am I forgetting it? Am I thinking that somehow I deserved it? I deserved your grace? I deserved your mercy? And if you had an answer with a yes, well, you got another thing coming, and we can have a conversation about that, and I'll prove you wrong through and through. But that would be the case. That's what he's going for here. Freely, and then eventually this persuades Esau, and it says in the very last part of it that he took it. He took the gift. Whew! Oh, that was a close one. He didn't know. Now this relationship looks like it might be able to move forward. Yeah, with any kind of thing, relationship like this, where it's, and let's face it, it's been 20 years. And these guys had a pretty checkered past going into this. So, just because you have a, a momentous reunion, a wonderful appearance of turnaround, does not necessarily mean like, oh, yay, everything's just hunky-dory and the relationship's all good and we're all happy as laughing now. <laughs> no, not necessarily. In all cases, the, in, a, in a broken relationship, when it comes back together, a lot of people think, well, that, that initial honeymoon period of it coming back together, oh, look, it's great, it's great. You know, this is wonderful, this person's wonderful, I'm wonderful, everything is wonderful. Until all of a sudden that person becomes that person again. <laughs> and they're like, hey, what? I thought we'd move past this. No, all you did is have a nice honeymoon period of emotional high and everything else, and now we're back to the grind of trying to figure out how to live life together, how to relate together. And, of course, for these guys, this changes would have to be made. And same for anybody, changes would have to be made. Were those changes even made? Those are always the questions. And especially a honeymoon period covers up really well. So that repair is not going to happen overnight. Now, so then we come to the next part of this incident, it's right before communion here, is... I called it thanks, but no thanks. I didn't know what else to call it, but because that's really what I see happen here. Because in an effort to be hospitable to Jacob, Esau offers this in verse 12. It says, and Esau said, let us journey on our way, and I will go ahead of you. He's offering protection. That, you know, his way of showing that he's potentially friendly towards Jacob. Even he's offering to be, he's going ahead, he's going to be the point man. It's like, hey, I'm going to be right out ahead of you. I'm going to show everybody that, you know, don't mess with my brother Jacob here. Allegedly, of course, it was brought up this morning. Uh, somebody pointed out that might have been Esau's way of keeping track of this guy. It's like, i got to keep my eyes on him. So that's a possibility. Jacob, though, graciously declines the officer, offer. Thanks, but no thanks. Verse 13 through 14, Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are frail, and that the nursing flocks and herds are a care to me. They are driven hard, for one day all the flocks will die. And he says, The Lord will pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly at the pace of the livestock that are ahead of me, and at the pace of the children, until I come to my Lord in Seir. All right, so here he's laying out a plan. He's like, hey, let me give you a different plan. I'm not going to do this. He appeals to the practical circumstances. Hey, i got herds and kids here. We can't, can't be zooming fast. We, we don't have a bus on the interstate here. we gotta, we got to move these guys slowly at, at, at a pace where they got to get water and all that stuff all the time. Very true. He ends with a promise of a future visit. He's like, hey, I'll, I'll come to my Lord and see her. Uh, yet, we don't see this visit happen until Isaac dies. So there's no visit. And Seir itself, this place of Seir where Esau is living at, 
for the moment appears just to, like has his tent there. It's like a temporary for the moment thing. Later on, we'll see where he actually makes it his abode, where he eventually stays there, and that's to the south. So he's kind of like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Esau does not relent on this. He doesn't doesn't relent. He's a, he, for whatever reason, he's like really pressing home. Hey, we're good to go here, if you will, maybe. And uh, he uh, yet Jacob continues to decline. In Genesis 33, verse 15, 16. And so Esau said, "Let me leave with you some of my of the people who are with me." Uh, but he, being Jacob, said, "Well, what need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my lord." So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. So here he's dismissing his aid again. A lot of little elements here. Remember, all these guys, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have always been guilty of like trying to find ways to help God in the plan. And one of those ways was always usually like, hey, how much extra help can I get on my side to get things done? And so, pragmatically speaking, having an extra army with you, hey, that sounds like that might be a good plan. It's like an extra security detail. Yay, you got that. But he says no. He says no. That's because post-wrestling match, it appears that he's moving more on board with just trusting God with the promise. Hey, you said you would get me through. You didn't say you were going to use my brother Esau to get me through. You're going to get me through. So I'm going to trust your promise to get me get me through, to get to, to fulfill the promises of security and prosperity down the line that you have for us. So there it is. He, instead of depending on everything else, he's depending on the promise now, which is awesome. Does not mean he's walking perfectly in this promise, though. As we're going to eventually see he doesn't have a conversation yet about where he's supposed to be. So we're going to see him kind of bumble along here a little bit of where he's going to go. And he's going to have a couple stopover points. And so this morning, we're only going to mention the one because he's on his way to Bethel. And Bethel, as we're going to see down the line, is when God tells him, hey, this is where I want you to live. But that doesn't happen yet. So we have a brief note about the first stop that he goes to in Genesis 33, verse 17. It says, but Jacob journeyed to Succoth and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Succoth. Now, some of you guys, Bible prophecy or Bible holidays, uh, Levitical stuff, might recognize Sukkoth as one of their, their feasts, the Feast of Sukkoth, the Feast of Booths, where everybody in Israel makes a little tent out of stuff and they celebrate their time when they were leaving Egypt and had no tents or hardly any place to live, so they, would, they made a tent to remember that. That's the same word. So here's this place. He's like, I got my little place of tents. Place, uh, you know, place where I'm living, got a made a little house, a little booth. And, but one thing, remember, you know, his brother said, hey, and he made a promise, I'm going to come down south to see you. Is that really happening? Because funny thing, though, I thought I got a little map here for you. Go to the next slide. Next slide. There we go. There's Sukkot there with the red arrow. And Seir, even further south in the map, where it's showing where the yellow area, that's not going down south to meet the brother. In other words, he's keeping his distance. And next week, we're going to see, see like, just to the west, uh, to, uh, you know, as you're looking at to the left there, you see Shechem. That's where he's going to end up next week. So he's staying up north. He's staying away from his brother. It's like, yeah, we're, we, we, we kissed and made up, but I don't think we're going to be able to hang out together. <laughs> so that's the thing. That, that sometimes can be the way things are. Very interesting. I'm stop here for a moment because we're going to get ready for communion. So I'm going to invite folks up for communion. And then I'll, I'll share one more thought here.
So in relation to our story this morning, remember I shared that Jesus will turn a story on its head. Because remember in the story of the prodigal son, it wasn't the inferior that was offering the gift. It was the superior. The, son, the prodigal son had no gift to bring. He had nothing. It was the superior, his father, who had everything to give. His was the grace that was there. For that culture, that that they just took the he Jesus took the Jacob and Esau story and just flipped it. Because that's what they were expecting. Blowing their minds or like. Jeff, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you talking about here? Jesus was pointing to what he was going to do. Because when we think of acceptance, we're the ones that need to be made acceptable. And of course, Anything we have, including ourselves and our best sacrifice, will always be unacceptable. So the superior, Jesus, had to come and die the horrible death to make a way that would be acceptable, where we could become acceptable in him. And that's amazing to think about. And that's why, again, going back to our, our story, the whole idea to reject him is to say, Jesus, your death was unacceptable. But my works are. The things that I do, those are the, what's acceptable. Which, you know, on his face is laughable at best, horrendous at worst. And so this morning, when we remember what Jesus was doing that night, he said, hey, this bread right here, this bread is my body that's going to be broken for you. Remember, they're like, what are you talking about? They did not realize Jesus was about to turn things on their head. So let's remember what he did with his body that day. And as, as I reiterate, and will reiterate every time now when I do communion, that this blood was gonna do something. He said, my blood's gonna do something that the blood has never done before. This blood I'm going to spill for you is it will make you clean. Remember the blood spilled before by every other lamb, thousands of lambs on those Passover days. They said it would be like a river of blood growing out. It was gross. It was nasty, but that was the whole point, showing the nastiness of sin, the horrendousness of sin, the sacrifice that would be needed just to cover it for a little while. But now the perfect Lamb of God was there to not just cover it, but to clean it. Turning it all on its head. Instead of being something that they would have to remember, look at how bad you were every year. No. To see how clean you are every day. Not by what you have done or what I have done, but by the blood of the land. Praise the Lord. Let's sing his praises one more time. 